Hey everybody, today we're going to be talking about the integumentary system. This is our first organ system that we're going to be discussing in the class. And remember, an organ is when you have two or more types of tissue that are performing a specialized function. An organ system is when you have more than two organs, two or more organs, that work together for a specific function. The integumentary system consists of the skin, the hair, the oil and sweat glands, nails, and the sensory receptors that are in the skin. The functions of the skin, first of all, is to protect you. The skin is what keeps the inside of you inside and the outside outside. It's also very important in helping you know what's going on around you. So the sensory input function is embedded in the skin. Skin is very important for temperature regulation as well as excretion. You're going to be excreting sweat and oils from this organ system. And it's also very important in vitamin production. So we produce vitamin D when we are exposed to sunlight. And vitamin D is very important in keeping your bones strong and healthy. The skin also stores quite a bit of blood in it. It has a lot of vascularity in the dermis. So here's a picture of the cutaneous membrane, the skin. And what you can notice first is that there's two layers. The top layer is called the epidermis. And the layer underneath is called the dermis. Epi means above. So epidermis is above the dermis. The epidermis is made out of stratified squamous epithelial tissue. So it has many, many, many layers of epithelial cells. The dermis underneath is made out of dense, irregular connective tissue. The dividing line between the connective tissue and the epidermis is called the basement membrane. From the dermis, there are little sort of fingers projecting up into the epidermis. Those are called the dermal papilla. And then from the epidermis, you have these little ridges that are sticking down. When you put them together, they almost go together like Velcro. And that helps to attach the epidermis very closely to the dermis. It also helps to increase surface area between the epidermis and the dermis. And one of the reasons we want to increase that surface area is that, remember, epithelial tissue is avascular. There's no blood supply going through here. But in the dermis, you can see there's lots and lots of blood vessels. So increasing the surface area between the epidermis and the dermis means that the epidermis can get some of the blood that is going through the dermis. You're going to see a couple of other structures in the skin. The most obvious ones are really the hair, the hair follicles. Now, the top of the hair structure is called the shaft above the skin, and below the skin it's called the hair root or the hair follicle. And you'll also see that these hair follicles are attached or associated with a little teeny muscle called an erector pili muscle. And these muscles will contract, and when they contract they pull on the root of the hair follicle, and it causes the entire hair follicle to move and the hair shaft to stand more upright. In humans, this is a bit of a vestigial structure, but in animals, it's used in two places. One, when an animal is cold, it can contract these erector pili muscles, and that will cause all of the hairs on the animal to stand up on end. And this actually helps to trap air around the skin of the animal and helps to insulate that animal a little bit. In addition, the autonomic nervous system, when it gets excited or nervous, when the uh, animal gets excited or nervous, it will cause uh, the erector pili muscle to contract and it will have all of these hairs stand up on end. So if you've ever seen a cat about to get into a fight or trying to tell you to back off, you'll see that it kind of gets all fluffed up and it's all its hairs stand on end. And it's because the animal is probably trying to make itself look bigger and badder. Any type of fight or flight response might cause those hairs to stand on end, which is why if you're nervous or 
uh, stressed out, you might get the hairs on the back of your neck standing up. In addition, in humans, we don't have enough body hair anymore to actually insulate ourselves, but we still have those erector pili muscles. So when you're cold, you tend to get goosebumps, which is basically these hairs standing up on end. There's a lot of blood vessels going through the dermis, none in the epidermis. We also have a couple of glands. One of them, called an, a sebaceous gland, is associated with the hair follicle. This produces an oil that helps to um, lubricate and moisturize the hair shaft as it's coming out from the skin. We also have some sweat glands. I think here's one right here. Here, here we go. Here's a sweat gland. Um, so this produces sweat, which is then um, excreted through a duct onto the surface of the skin. So this is part of the excretion portion or excretion function of the skin. So the oil from the sebaceous gland and sweat from the eccrine gland are excreted out um, onto the surface of the skin. We also have another kind of sweat gland. This is called an apocrine sweat gland, and this is only going to be found in certain areas on your body. And this is also associated with a, with a hair follicle. You can see the eccrine sweat gland opens onto the surface of the skin, but an apocrine sweat gland actually is releasing its product into that hair follicle. So you find apocrine sweat glands in the groin, in the armpit, um, whereas the eccrine sweat glands are found on the forehead, the back, um, arms, places like that. A couple of different types of sensory structures here. We have a couple of corpuscles. This is a Bacinian corpuscle, Meissner corpuscle, we also have some free nerve endings here that are wrapped around the um, hair follicle and the hair root. And I think that's it for this. Um, here's a free nerve ending here that is very um, superficial. That's it for this particular picture. Let's talk about the epidermis. The epidermis has a couple of different types of cells. The first one is called a keratinocyte. You can see that right here. This is what this these make up about 90% of the cells in your epidermis. These are just your regular epithelial cells. They produce keratin. Keratin is a protein that helps to um, hold the cells together. We also have some other cells that are called melanocytes. That's what this looks like. And melanocytes produce a pigment called melanin. And about 8% of the cells in your epidermis are melanocytes. We have Langerhans cells, and these are a special type of macrophage that's going to be crawling around in your skin looking to make sure that nothing has... Um, gotten past the uh, barrier of your skin. So these are surveying and making sure there's no foreign invaders in your, in your skin. We also have tactile or Merkel cells, and Merkel cells are part of your sensory receptors. They will give information about what they're feeling to a sensory neuron that brings the information to the brain. So in the epidermis, we actually have either four or five layers of cells. So the first layer of the epidermis, the layer that's the deepest layer and sits right on that basement membrane that's between the dermis and the epidermis, is going to be the stratum basal. And I always think of basal as being like basement or base layer. And these are stem cells, so they divide constantly. They're always dividing to produce the rest of all the cells in the epidermis. And you can actually see they have a drawing of a cell right here that's in, looks like anaphase. So as they divide, that new cell will be pushed up into the next layer, and one of the cells will remain in the basement layer. So the job of the stratum basal is to go through cell division, and they also produce intermediate filaments. 
those intermediate filaments attach to the desmosomes, which holds these cells together and also attaches the cells to the basement membrane. You can also see that there are melanocytes in this layer. So here's a melanocyte right there, and you can see how it has those arms that are sticking out into the next layer, and the arms are full of little dots that represent the melanin, the pigment that they're providing. The next layer up is the stratum spinosum, and that's a pretty big layer here. They have big cells, the cells have nuclei in them, and you can see that the cells are all held together with these little um, intermediate filaments. These stratum spinosum cells are by and large made out of keratinocytes. So these are cells that are producing keratin and those uh, care and that keratin protein is used to make intermediate fibers and help these cells all stick together and stick to the stratum basal. There are some um, Langerhans cells in this layer, and these cells will move about and survey the area just to make sure that there is no foreign substances being introduced into the skin. The next layer is called the stratum granulosum. And you can see here that these have lots of little granules in them, which is why we call it the granulosum. These cells are starting to flatten out and they're starting to go through apoptosis. And remember, apoptosis is programmed cell death. So the cells are dying, and one of the reasons they're dying is because they're really far away from a blood supply. Remember, the blood supply is down here in the dermis. The stratum basal are getting lots of blood because they're right next to the dermis. The stratum spinosum gets less blood because um, all the nutrients have to diffuse through a lot of cells to get to them. And by the time you're all the way up here as, at stratum granulosum, these cells are starting to die. They also make something called keratohyalin proteins, and this is what helps to waterproof the cell, keep water not only out, like if you're in the shower or you get caught in the rain or you go swimming, but it helps to hold the body water inside of the body so you don't dehydrate. When you suffer from a burn, oftentimes one of the biggest problems besides infection is dehydration because you've lost this waterproofing layer. The next layer is called the stratum lucidum, and you can see here it's a sort of very thin, clear layer, and you're really only going to find this in what we call thick skin. Thick skin is the bottom of the feet, the soles of the feet, and the palms of the hand. So most of the other skin on your body does not have this stratum lucidum layer. Our top layer is called the stratum corneum. These are dead keratinocytes. So remember, these are keratinocytes down here. They start to de uh, to die and go through apoptosis in the granulosum, and by the time they get to the corneum, they're dead. They've lost the nuclei, they have no organelles, and they're just dead skin cells. And there's about um, 25 to 30 layers of dead skin cells on the outside of your skin. When you have dry skin or when it sloughs off, it is the stratum corneum that you're losing. Okay, underneath the epidermis is the dermis, and again, this is dense irregular connective tissue, and we have all the normal connective tissue cells in there, fibroblasts, macrophages, adipocytes, remember those are those fat cells. We also have a really um, good collection of collagen and elastic fibers in there. Again, your skin is pretty stretchy. It has to move with you and stretch over you as you move your body around, but it's really quite strong. So we have both of these type of tissues in there, as well as all the things we've talked about. There are two layers in the dermis. The first one is the papillary region. And this is the part that's very close to the epidermis, and it contains those dermal papilla, as well as a couple of different nerve uh, endings, Meissner corpuscles and free nerve endings. The reticular layer makes up the majority of the dermis. So the papillary layer is only 20%. The reticular layer is about 80%. And this is where all of your collagen and elastic fibers are, and this is the part that really gives the skin its strength. 
Now a word about those epidermal ridges and the dermal papilla. So these are formed during the third month of gestation in the womb. And the epidermis, again, sort of projects little fingers down into the dermis. This is going to do a couple things. It's going to make a very strong bond between the epidermis and the dermis. It's also going to help increase the friction on your hands and feet. Think about what we use our hands and feet for. If you were to get rid of all these little tiny ridges, it would be very hard for you to grip things that are very smooth. Um, it also helps to increase the surface area not only for blood supply but also sensory reception. On the tops of these ridges there are little sweat uh, gland openings and when you touch things oftentimes those sweat glands which are made up of not only uh, salt and water but also some oils um, they're going to leave impressions of these ridges and so we call those fingerprints. So let's talk about melanocytes for a minute. Remember, melanocytes are sitting on or right on top of the stratum basal, and they have little projecting arms that uh, secrete melanin, a pigment, out into the stratum spinosum. And the reason that the melanocytes do this is because that melanin is protective. So when you are exposed to UV light, the reason you get a tan is because you are trying to protect your skin from the UV light. So UV light can cause all kinds of problems in the DNA of your skin cells. And we want to shield those stratum basal cells because they're growing and dividing all the time. Um, that UV radiation can cause changes in those stratum basal cells. So more DNA damage means that um, you're going to have more and more melanin synthesized. So really, somebody with a good tan is basically saying that's somebody with um, a lot of damage from the sun. Now, if you are a dark-skinned person, you don't have any more melanocytes than a light-skinned person. But what you do have more of is melanin. So everybody has the same number of melanocytes. It's just people that have naturally darker skin um, produce more melanin, and the melanin is better quality. It sort of stays around longer. It doesn't break down quite as easily. If you're very, very pale, you have less melanin being produced, and the melanin is not particularly long-lasting or effective. That's it for today. Come back again for the lecture on hair and I'll see you in class.